There we go. Now we're recording. All right. All right. Today we are back with Joshua Spodek for our third talk in this series. Uh, we had one nice long talk about problems and environment. And then we had a second talk where we kind of talked about different historical examples showing that it is possible to cause lots of change or to drive change in people's behavior. And today we are going to be talking about Joshua Spodek and his solutions and how he leads in environment. Josh, how are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you for asking. I hope you're doing well too. Good. How, how was my summary? Is that summary a pretty good summary of the things we've talked about so far? Yeah, broadly speaking, it's, you know, the way I think it's useful to look at it, you know, you can look at the graphs and charts and read the IPCC report. Well, that'll give you the climate, but it wouldn't give you the population. It wouldn't give you pollution. So there's a lot out there. And I think the elk and the, the um, spider mites and the yeast and the Hawaiians, I think that makes it a little more accessible. I hope that was the case with people. Mm -hmm. Once you get that picture, if you look up the science and get the numbers, you can go into a lot lower level of detail. Mm -hmm. I think it's better to get the meaning first. And then to see that there, for me, for me, it came after acting that I mm -hmm. learned how many people are role models, you know, with the abolitionists and Deming, Viravidya, and that gave me so much hope. Right. And not just hope, expectation of success. Mm -hmm. You know, there has to be a bit of Churchill message. You know, in, in 1940, he, he was like, this is bad. It's like really bad. Europe mm -hmm. is, is lost. We, like, we're just this little island. Yeah. We don't know if America is going to help us out, and um, but we'll fight them on the beaches. We'll fight them everywhere, you know. And I have nothing to offer but my blood, toil, sweat, and tears. And um, and we need that message. It's if we stopped emitting pollution right now, it would still keep you know the sea levels are going to rise. And and we are not stopping right now. Mm -hmm. Maybe as a result of this podcast, it'll happen. Or this uh, conversation will happen a lot faster. We I hope that's the hope. case. Um, but, but I forget if I said the, the part about sports and, you know, sometimes, sometimes you win a game, sometimes you lose a game. What keeps me up at night is games that we could have won, but didn't because I didn't play it at my best mm. or I didn't practice enough. Or I, well, I would say if I skipped a practice, I never skipped a practice because I wanted to be prepared. Right. And things may get difficult things will get difficult. Things are difficult and they will get more, much more difficult. How, and we may suffer in terms of pain and, and, and hardship and loss. Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, this is phrase I, I came up, it's like a Buddhist phrase, I think it says, pain is, un, pain is un inevitable, suffering is optional. Mm -hmm. How we respond to it emotionally is a matter of, um, there are games that we lost, but we did, I, we played with everything we had. And if we played above that level, even sometimes that happens, you learn during the game to play better. Then you feel great about it, even if you lost. Right. You know, you prefer to win. And so I will measure my success. I, how I feel about what's going on deep inside will be by, have I given everything I could? Am I giving relative to my, as much as I can relative to my potential? Right. And that's what I hope that we all do not just watch from the sidelines or feel like, you know, keep moving the goalposts mm -hmm. as Chappelle and Ali and Parks did not. Mm -hmm. And then uh, that transitions, I hope, into, into what we actually do. Right. And as we talked about before, most of the things that I learned, I could not have learned had I not started acting first. Right. And so that was something you started quite a long time ago, right? Taking on all of these different challenges and things. Are those something that did, the, did those, how difficult was it to start doing those things? How was it, how hard was it to start making those changes? Well, I had, I mean, the first change that I would say was me acting for others in the environment in stewardship would be the challenge seven years ago to see if I could go for a week without buying packaged food. Mm -hmm. But that challenge came after many challenges before. And I've, 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 talked to a lot of people about this like where did that come from because before that challenge was mm -hmm. avoiding processed foods and before that one if i went all the way back to the beginning mm -hmm. 
the earliest recollection I have of this train in my life, trail, was reading the book that I just stumbled on when I was in high school, Diet for a Small Planet. Hmm. I believe it came out in the 70s. Before I read that book, I thought meat was necessary for life. That told me that meat was not necessary for life. And then I still didn't act on it hmm. until years later when I, because I thought I didn't really know what to do. It was kind of complicated. I didn't, but then I forget if I said this before, but I bought the chicken breast and I breaded it myself and I made chicken nuggets hmm. from, the, from scratch. Uh -huh. Oh yeah, I'm, I forgot what I kept eating. What I the meat that I liked the most as a child was hamburgers, hot dogs, chicken nuggets. Uh -huh. Very processed stuff that you yeah. can make with no meat today, <laughs> just as processed. And, you know, I guess Impossible Burgers, maybe some people can't tell the difference, I'm not sure. So I like the really processed stuff. Because if I ate a, um, a drumstick, I knew, I, like, it's clearly a leg. Right. <laughs> and that was not comfortable to me. And uh, you bite into, like, the, um, the tendons. Yeah. And I was like, ah, that's part, of, like, I didn't like that. But hot dogs, hamburgers, there's, like, no trace of where it came from. Yeah. So I could eat that. But then when I made my own chicken nuggets from scratch, it, I accidentally connected the super processed to a bird. Right. And once that happened, I saw the super processed as the bird and then the hot dogs, hamburger, same thing. So after the, I think after I made chicken nuggets from scratch for the first time, this was when I was in college, mm -hmm. I think I had fish once after that and then just couldn't eat meat anymore. Wow. And that was 1990. Uh -huh. Then a couple, you know, I didn't say I'm going to stop eating meat. It was, I just couldn't do it anymore. Uh -huh. It was, I, I never stopped eating something that I wanted to eat. It mm -hmm. always, I found out something. So then later I found out about um, corn syrup, not uh -huh. particularly healthy. Sure. Uh, and so like a couple of years after the meat, it was a corn syrup, also um, hydrogenated oils. Mm -hmm. I learned about, that wasn't even a diet thing. That was just learning that they had done the research. They knew that it was less healthy than unhydrogenated, mm -hmm. but advertised that it was more healthy. And I just thought they're trying to profit off of my health. I couldn't do business with them. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, it was a more of a, you know, I wouldn't want to, I just don't want to do business with someone who does that. Right. And then somewhere after that, it was, um, there are various little experiments that I did with food. And each time I did it, I thought when I stopped eating meat, that would really mess my life up, but it, and it didn't. And then I thought, actually, corn syrup and hydrogenated oils, they knocked out more than I expected. Mm -hmm. I thought those were going to be minor changes relative to the meat, but they're actually yeah. bigger changes because it knocked out whole aisles of the supermarket that I didn't realize. Like, really? I didn't realize the chips and soda aisle is completely, I just stopped going to that aisle. Huh. Then, um, so that was well after. And then there was one um, with the processed food. That one was a really joyful one. I, I was like, what's processed? You know, mm -hmm. Twinkie is processed. Eating an apple raw, that's not processed. Right. But there's lots of things in between. Like if I peel a banana, is that processed? Mm -hmm. And I kept, you know, geek that I am, or rather someone who likes simple simplicity in life. Uh -huh. I thought, what's a definition I can go with just to try this out? And my definition was if someone has removed fiber, so whole wheat bread, oh. I would eat, but okay. white bread, I would not. Oh. Um, corn syrup got knocked out by that because that's, it's, you've taken corn and you just took the sugar out. Right. And it, it worked for me pretty well. It's like a, a nice, clean dividing line. Am mm -hmm. I saying others should follow us? No, I'm just trying to, uh, that was my little experiment. Uh -huh. So it was a little bit of effort to, you know, some foods I was like, you know, I grandfathered in uh, alcohol and at that time, olive oil. Oh. And I kept those in. Uh-huh. But otherwise I didn't really notice my diet changing, pardon me, changing that much. Uh -huh. But I did notice one thing. Definition on the abs started coming in. Huh. And I was like, this is this is an, this experiment has succeeded. I like this experiment. <laughs> so these are all the things that led up to um, avoiding packaged food. I'd done a lot of experiments and enough of them had worked out that um, I had some expectation that this would work out. So it wasn't like out of the blue, Josh tries to change his diet in some way. Mm -hmm. It's Josh tries yet another in a long series of experiments. I've left out ones that didn't work out. 
mm -hmm. that I can't remember what they were. Oh, there's another one that um, when I was in college, a lot of people would boycott companies that were doing business with apartheid South Africa. And that mm -hmm. led me to drink, not to drink Coca-Cola or Pepsi. Oh. Then at some point, no one ever said, okay, the boycott's over. But one day Nelson Mandela was president of South Africa. And I figured I probably can go back to drinking these things. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, all right, I know I stopped, but I don't remember I started in the first place. Oh. So I never, I, the last time I drank Coca-Cola or Pepsi was in the, in the 80s. And I just never restarted. Mm -hmm. um, there were other soft drinks that I drink that were like local. I remember having one that was like a local soda. And, mm -hmm. But now I wouldn't drink that. Right. So rather than just doing a big all at once change, slow changes over time with kind of smaller steps. Well, now you might say I've changed my diet a lot, but each step at the time felt like it was huge. Mm -hmm. I felt like not even meat. I mean, it took me a long time to get there. I mean, when it happened, it happened. But I re between reading the book in high school and college, when I, I, I suppose several years had passed. Mm -hmm. And then even then, after I stopped eating meat, I, I, I increased my eggs and dairy a lot mm -hmm. to make up for it. So now I haven't had, egg, I don't know how long it's been since I've had eggs or dairy. Right. That, they took a lot longer. I mean, I, I slowly decreased those until zero, but 10 or 15 years probably. Mm -hmm. So you had been driving these changes in your own life long before you had decided to start doing leadership and environment stuff. Yes. Now the going vegetarian in the first place, probably it's hard to remember now that far back, but it probably had an environmental component. Mm -hmm. But- um, not so the hydrogen and oil and the corn syrup, uh, the apartheid stuff that had, that was unrelated to the environment mm -hmm. and notice all of those, those are mostly about me. Mm -hmm. The avoiding packaged food was about someone else. I anticipated this would make my life worse. I was taking one for the team. I was sacrificing. Mm -hmm. That was a different, that was acting in stewardship. I would say now, but I didn't yet know I hadn't made that shift in life towards stewardship so much yet. Right. Now I, I expect that acting in service of others will bring reward greater than I would have as a youth expected. As a youth, I would expect, well, why do I do it for someone else? I got, I got my own life to work on. Right. At what point did you make that step into saying, okay, I've made changes in my life. I now want to lead others into being able to make similar changes? Well, I think I described before the, the result of that first experiment, uh, sorry, of the one with the avoiding packaged food, uh -huh. that um, there was the material change of, it was cheaper. I mean, I thought it'd be more expensive, it was cheaper. I thought it'd be less convenient, it was more convenient. Once I learned, I mean, the inconvenience was not packaged versus unpackaged, it was knowing how to cook versus not knowing how to cook. Mm -hmm. I thought it'd be less accessible for people in a food desert, more accessible for people in a food or it improved the lives of people in a food desert. Sure. Uh, and, and I got invited out to teach them and stuff like that. So, but there was the mental part of why did I think it would be the opposite of how it's actually been from a physics perspective? If your theory is wrong, mm -hmm. if you have any theory, if you have a theory and then the experiment is different than the theory predicts, you got to look back at the theory. Right. And then, you know, that led me to, while that's processing in my head, I do the challenge myself to go without flying for a year. Uh -huh. And that also I expected to be horrible and was awesome. <laughs> and I can go into the details of, of it, you know, not costing me my job. It gave me more control over my career and it's more time with family and all that. I, I think I talked about all that before, mm -hmm. but that really reinforced like, what's going on? Why do I think it's going to be one way, but it's not. Right. And then I started getting this idea of like, when you're in one culture and one system, you can't, the values of the other don't make sense until you're in the other one. And then you start realizing, oh, it's not reality that that's, that's that way. That's just a set of beliefs that I adopted without realizing it. Mm -hmm. So then I thought, well, who's out there saying this, that there's another way of doing it that works. That's actually probably by most people's sets of values is probably better. Mm -hmm. No one. So that set me to 
this has got to get out there. Because as long as people think it's going to be uh, a slog, a burden, a chore, I don't want to, but I have to, then no one's going to want to do it. You're going to have to legislate people into it. And then people are going to push back on that and feel like they're being forced into it. And that doesn't work very well. Right. So it's all management, no leadership. Then I think I talked about how I gave a set of lectures at NYU that didn't mm -hmm. go, they went well in that they were a great learning experience, but they went badly in the sense of all the pushback and like, stop telling us what to do. And then there's the experience with Jay with the, um, when he decided to pick up garbage, mm -hmm. uh, 10, 10 pieces a day for 30 days. Right. And that's when I realized that there's a chance of it working up until that I thought, oh, pff, give up, you know, <laughs> just do the best I can for myself. Right. And hope that things don't fall apart before I die, mm -hmm. which is a really sad way to live. It is. <laughs> the, so then there was a whole bunch of experimentation. So that's when I decided. So after the plane was when, after the no flying, when that started to shift from being like, oh, I can make my own adventure. Mm -hmm. I can, you know, then that's when I realized I got to share this. The lectures didn't go well, so I wanted to give up many times. Mm -hmm. Then when it worked with Jay, that's when, uh, with the garbage picking up, that's when I thought, ah, here's what I should do. And I can start a podcast. People have been talking to me about doing a podcast since my first book was when I did like, I don't know, 50 podcasts to help promote the book. Mm -hmm. And there are a bunch of podcast hosts who brought me back. I was the first person they had back a second time. And a couple, I was the first that I was the first guest that they had a third time. So people tell me, oh, Josh, you're a really good guest on a podcast. You should do your own. So now I had people have been advising me for totally separate reasons. Think about doing a podcast. And I wanted to get something out there. So I thought oh, I'll do the podcast, not just on Josh mm -hmm. talking, but that at that time it was called leadership in the environment. And when I started, mm -hmm. I did not yet have a technique. I just knew I wanted people to have an experience like Jay had. Mm -hmm. And it probably took about, well, I know when I asked Seth Godin, if he would be a guest, he said, talk to me after you've done 50 episodes. I thought that meant, hmm, is Josh really serious about this? So I wrote him back and I was like, God, oh, I've written like thousands of, pod of, of blog posts. I haven't missed any. If you're not sure if I'm gonna be in it or not, I'm in it, you know, if I say it, you know, and he wrote back, talk to me after 50. And then I realized after when I got like 40 or 50 episodes, you know, 40 episodes in, I was like, I learned a lot. Yeah. It wasn't, is he in it? Well, it was maybe it was partly, is Josh really serious about it? Uh -huh. But also you learned so much in that time. He just wanted, I think he wanted to make sure I'd gotten past the little flutters of the up and down learning experience. Uh -huh. But I also know that when I worked with him, I had yet, not yet learned that technique because if you listen to my episode with him, uh -huh. I believe you can hear that he knows I'm gonna pretty, like he sees it coming that I'm gonna say, hey, wanna do something for the environment. Right. And he had prepared leading up to that that he's like, oh, I'm already doing as much as I can. I was like, oh, okay. Only later did I realize what we'll cover in this one is not to say like, here's something you could do or will you do something? Uh -huh to start with the emotion, start with where if, if leadership to me starts with the other person, mm -hmm. what that matters to them, their values, their hopes, their dreams, but really what, what's in their heart, mm -hmm. not otherwise it's, if, if it's imposing on them that actually can silence that. Right. If someone, if someone's experience with the, if someone, if what motivates someone in the environment is like for me, my sledding hill for people who've watched my third TEDx talk, mm -hmm. I talk about the sledding hill, which is the best sledding hill in the world. Mm. Over the course of my childhood, and by the, certainly by the time I was coming back home from college, the road between me and the sledding hill was wider and wider, so less close. Mm -hmm. And there were houses near me that were built, or places that were like this overgrown area had houses mm -hmm. when, one time when I came back from college. So nice houses, I guess, but you know, a little, we used to go. As kids, we'd go in the bushes there. Yeah. And for that matter, I have not seen a flexible flyer on sale in, I don't know how long. I mean, certainly not since I was a kid. There aren't, there's not enough snow. The warm, the global, the globe has warmed. 
Yeah. So my sledding hill, it's just, I mean, we used to go multiple times per year. And if it snowed once, we'd have several days of snow. Mm -hmm. But now no one in my neighborhood is going to have a flexible flyer. And I used to take it down with a candle and wax the rims, not the rims, the, uh, the rails. Mm -hmm. And on a really good run, it was, it had these like levels. And so oh. you could kind of, you could get some good air sometimes. <laughs> That's why one time it broke and I had to like get out the drill and like put it back together. Yeah. The best was when you could get, you go down and there's a turn and you make that turn really hard, you know, really leaning in. And then there's a stream at the very bottom. So oh. you really wanted to go, you'd have to bail out and like catch your sled just before you go into the stream. So it doesn't get all wet. <laughs> and then you're walking back up the hill and the dogs are all running around and everyone's having a great time. Yeah. And you get home and like your toes are frostbitten that you didn't notice because you're a kid and you're, and we were just having too much fun. That's not a part of my neighborhood anymore. Right. So if that's what, and most people have their equivalent, if they grew up in Florida, it's not gonna be sledding hill, but it'll be the beach or, you know, I had, um, one of the guests that comes to mind a lot is, uh, Brian Brayman, mm -hmm. who was a Philadelphia Eagle. He had won the Super Bowl, And he talked about his grandfather taking fishing in the Pacific Northwest. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's just less fish around and there's more garbage in the stream. People, if that's what's in someone's heart, that's what will motivate someone. If it's just one apple tree, but that's what's in their heart. And I tell that person, you know, Bangladesh is going to be underwater in a couple of years. We have to fix that. That may be the case. And maybe, you know, certainly I value 50 million people in Bangladesh over one apple tree. But if the apple tree is what motivates someone and I talk Bangladesh, I'm actually devaluing what they care about. Right. And if I say to them, if they say, yeah, you know, and this apple tree, and, I, and if I then say apple tree, Bangladesh, <laughs> then it disengages them. Mm -hmm. If I want them to work on Bangladesh, the fastest, most effective way to get there is through their heart, through going to leadership is about where the other person is, mm -hmm. not where I want them to be, not where they should be, not where other people are not where the fastest place to get there is, mm -hmm. but where they are. That takes listening. That takes support. Right. I don't see a lot of that out there. That's, so that's this, the strategy, the, 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 the technique that I developed mm -hmm. that my first TEDx talk describes it. And we're about to do it. Okay. And I recommend people listening I haven't really done it this way. Uh, usually I'm doing it with someone. Yeah. Uh, not what I'm doing with you, but like someone's watching or listening. I recommend watching what we do and learning the technique, practicing it with others. Mm -hmm. Someone you, someone that you support and supports you back. Someone non-judgmental. Mm -hmm. And the first couple of times you do it, it takes a little practice. Mm -hmm. But when you get activated on your sledding hill, you will do things for your reasons. And if you want to work on Bangladesh, start with the apple tree, you know, your sledding hill, whatever comes up with you that, you know, you'll sit down with your husband or your wife or your kid or your coworkers or your neighbors or whoever you work with, you'll do it with them and they'll do it with you. You'll both come up with something that's in your heart, your sledding hill. You'll act on it. And then you'll start realizing like Jay, he picked up garbage. And he realized, oh, it's not, there's nothing to be ashamed about. There's no problem with me picking up other people's garbage. Mm -hmm. What else can I do? That people come back with that a lot. What more can I do? At Dove, you know, was like, I'm going to sell the car. Ended up, you know, just keeping it in the garage, but, you know, not using it. Right. Uh, and, you know, um, Lorna is like, here's all these people to meet. And um, Mark Reed keeps every year not giving gifts, not giving material gifts, right. giving something of more value, which is, time and themselves presence ah oh that's interesting presence ending with the letter ce as opposed <laughs> to presence ending with ts oh there you go oh wow presence man. versus presence <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah moment of moment of uh, silence not moment of silence but like moment of recognition of like yeah. stumbling on something there oh so this happens all the time 
and if it doesn't happen with you the first time, it'll happen with you the second time. Not you, you, but you, the listener, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the viewer. When you do it with someone else, the joy that you get from leading someone else and them, come, them coming back and saying, oh, I never did that before. I'm really glad, you know, thanks for leading me through that. It's a really warm, warm heartwarming feeling. Mm. And you get this community that starts forming when you start doing it with more and more people. Mm -hmm. And who knows, you might get, you know, podcast going, that's what happened with me and a, a community of podcast hosts that hopefully listener, viewer, you'll become a part of. Which Let's they do can it. contact you at any time, right? To, if they wanted to... Uh do a little bit more podcasting or something or doing this yes. process. And you know what's coming because I've walked you through this training. And let's see, I should, I should ask you, mm -hmm. should I describe the theory first or the, the process or just do it and then say what I did afterward? Yeah, that's actually, I was actually going to ask you the same thing. Which do you think would be the better approach? Do you think it would be better to describe the whole process? Maybe, maybe it'd be good to give just kind of a good general quick overview for us just so that people kind of have an idea of where it's going before we actually go through it. Okay. And by the way, this is unit four of, in my book, Leadership Step-by-Step, Step, mm -hmm. specifically applied to this. So okay. um, my definition of leadership is helping people do what they wanted to do already before you ever came along, mm -hmm. but couldn't figure out how to do. Okay. A lot of people think of leadership as like, if I have to lead someone to do it, they, wouldn't, they weren't going to do it otherwise. They don't want to do it. But that's... Mm -hmm. that's coercion or something different than leadership. Leadership mm -hmm. is, or Eisenhower said, getting the other guy to do your thing for his reason. Right. It starts with their motivation. I'm not trying to get someone to do something that they don't want to do. If I talk to someone and they say, as John Lee Dumas did at first, you know, oh, I don't care. You know, I, you'll hear on that episode, like I, I probed a little bit past there and then found something. Mm -hmm. But if I probed and didn't get anything, Actually, that happened with me with something the other day. This kid who grew up, and he's he like, I grew up in the city. I, I really never saw any green, never went to camp. And he had no apple tree, no sledding hill. Now, maybe he's protecting himself. So until I get something, mm -hmm. I'm hold, holding off on taking any steps past there. Huh. So um, my process with... Okay, so my definition of leadership is helping people do helping people do what they wanted to do already, but haven't figured out how. I got to, that means you got to start with what do they want to do? Right. My way of doing it is in a sentence to behave and communicate in ways to make the other person feel comfortable sharing what motivates them. Normally they don't share this because it makes them feel vulnerable. Mm -hmm. if, if, if I know what you care about, I can judge you, I can laugh at you, I can, I can manipulate you. And we've all been judged and laughed at and manipulated. Mm -hmm. So we, we generally protect our greatest passions, our greatest motivations, or our greatest vulnerabilities. So we tend to protect those things. But it's also what we want to share the most. We love to share our deepest passions. That's what intimacy is about. Intimacy is when we're vulnerable. So you're married, you have a wife. Presumably, over time, you're learning more and more about each other's things you don't sh didn't share about on the first date. Yeah, absolutely. And you feel good when you share something and the person, even if they disagree with you, if they, if that person supports you in holding that belief or having that part of you, having that part about you. Mm -hmm. So let me go back. I, I digressed to behave and communicate in ways to make the other person feel comfortable sharing what motivates them, which is normally something that makes them feel vulnerable. Then when you connect that passion I use the word passion to mean strong motivation. Mm -hmm. To connect that strong motivation, that passion to a task, you imbue that task with meaning for them and they will do it for their reason, not yours. Mm -hmm. And they will feel like, they, they will feel they're doing it for themselves and they will feel inspired. They will often thank you. And the, the more that you get them to do, the more that you lead them this way, the more that they will thank you, even though they might be working very hard, maybe, maybe long hours because it's what they've wanted to do. And when I teach this in my courses, I've had students, many students and, and my coaching clients come back and say, I led someone who reports to me in the office this way, because I got all these executives. And multiple times people come back and said, that person shed tears of gratitude and said, I've never had someone, I've always been working just, to, you know, do the job because it's your job. Right. 
never because for my reasons. And finally, I can do it for my own reasons. I love when someone comes back and says, they evoked tears of joy from someone, someone else. So as applied to sustainability, I first start by asking them, so I, I start with a step zero, I call it, because it's not really, this is, this is always a quick yes. It's, you know, do you care about the environment? Is the environment something that, that matters to you? Mm -hmm. I've never gotten a no on that. So it's a quick yes, just to get us into the field. And sometimes they'll say, do you mean environment like trees? Do you mean environment like the people in my life? So I'm like, yeah, trees and grass and the sky and nature. that environment. Yeah, what we think about when we think about nature, the earth and that sort of stuff. And I mm -hmm. think people generally get that. Okay, so question number one is, when you act on the environment, oh, I guess sometimes I'll say at the beginning, is it something you, you've acted on? Is it something mm -hmm. you've done something about? And that's generally, people have at least like, you know, walked instead of taking the car some, at, w at least once. Right. So I say, all right, when you act on the environment, what do you, what do you think about? What do you think about when you think about the environment? What motivates you? Right. Almost always they come back with a, what I call a cocktail party answer. There's a vulnerability there. A lot of people say environment, like people get judged on the environment. Oh, you're not doing enough or you're greenwashing or something like that. So people first want, they'll say something like, oh, children, you know, future generations, or, um, you know, oh, dolphins, they're cute, so adorable. Uh -huh. Not personal, right? That's not the sledding hill. Right. Everyone, everyone has something in their childhood. I'm pretty sure this guy that I talked about who grew up in the city has something. Mm -hmm. The, actually, I'm going to digress a second here. Sure. I was talking to him on, on, um, uh, on the phone and he sent me a voice message. I said to him, ask a bunch of other people this question. The question that I, I just said, mm -hmm. and tell me what, what you come back with. Because he's like a longtime friend. Mm -hmm. And he sent me a voice message. He recorded the conversation with someone else. And the person gave a cocktail party answer. And then the person started giving a, a bigger, what was her, the person who was talking? I forget what, the, what that person, but that person started giving me a heartfelt answer. Mm -hmm. It was their sledding hill. Sure. So I think that I actually got a message from him again, just before we recorded. So I haven't heard it yet. I have a feeling he's starting to see that he also has stuff, mm -hmm. but we'll see. Some people it's more protected than others. All right. So they come back often with a cocktail party answer. Mm -hmm. So then I say, well, you know, usually it's like a story or an image, something from your childhood often, but maybe it's a recent experience, but you know, what images or what stories? Mm -hmm. And then usually they will kind of give you a hint at something. And then you ask confirming and clarifying questions because there's something there and you just simply want to not judge and support, you show support by um, asking them to clarify. Mm. That gives them the signal that what they say matters to right. you. Resist saying, oh, that reminds me of my blah, 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 and, and resist talking about yourself. Mm -hmm. So it's just sitting back and listening and let, let it coming out and just um, confirming and clarifying questions. And then they'll often tell you, the way I talked about the sledding hill mm -hmm. and you know, going down the hill and turning in the jump and the getting air and the, you know, um, that you'll get something like that. Right. And then you want to get to where you say, what emotions did you feel? You know, can you put a name to the emotions that you felt? Mm -hmm. So for me, that would be like fun and playful and down in the snow, jumping around with the dogs and things mm -hmm. like that. A lot of times people also tinge that with what I also said, that's just not there anymore. Right. You often get this contrast of like, something that most people would describe as positive and something of like foreboding. Mm. All right. So you get these emotions. That's, that's what the end of part of that first question is, is leading to the, them to name those emotions. Step two is to say almost word for word, the following based on those emotions that you felt and you might name them at this point, right? That, that fun, that playfulness, but also that foreboding. I invite you, at your option, you don't have to do this, but at your option, to think, that, to think of something you can do to act on those feelings. Now, before they can respond, a lot of times, if you let them respond at this point, they'll say, mm -hmm. a lot of people will say, oh, but what one person does doesn't matter. And I've never been able to get out of that hole. 
<laughs> then the, if I say, but this isn't for that, they'll say, but it doesn't matter. So before they can say anything, I say, now before you answer, I say, note what I didn't say. I'm, a lot of people hear something I didn't say. I didn't say what's the biggest thing you could do or what's the most important thing you could do or what Greenpeace or National Geographic or the New York Times tells you to do. It will affect the environment, but that's not the point. This is for you to act on something you care about. Mm -hmm. And it may be big, it may be small. That's not the point. It's you're doing it. And then I've done this enough times. This is all still quoting what I say. Mm -hmm. um, I found that there are three things that make it work. It has to be something new, something you're not already doing mm -hmm. or weren't already going to do. Mm -hmm. So if you're already recycling and you say recycling, you're already doing that, something new. Then it has to be something that you do with your own hands. Because I work with all these leaders and they're always quick to say like, oh, I'll get my team to do this. <laughs> or I'll start some program where other people will do that. Right. This is something for you to do. We learn from our personal experience. Right. And it has to be something that uh, has a physical component. So that if they say, oh, I'll watch that movie I've been meaning to watch, a documentary, or I'll read that book, or I'll raise my awareness. Great, do those and take the next step to behavior. Something, you don't have to measure it, but it has to have some physical component, something that could in principle be measured. Right. And how big or small it is, doesn't matter. It's you acting on your emotions. That's all basically what I say. Um, and you can listen, I mean, I've got hundreds of episodes. You can hear me doing this and then they, uh -huh. they can listen to your episodes or any of the other um, The Sustainable Life episodes from, from the different hosts to get each person's different take on it. Mm -hmm. But it's generally that structure. Mm -hmm. Then they'll often come back at this point and say, well, I'm already doing this, I'm already doing that, I'm already doing this, I'm already doing that. And it's hard for them to think of something new because they've, they're still trying to think of like, what are they supposed to do? Mm -hmm. Let them go through that and say, all right, well, okay. Those are the things that you're already doing. Mm -hmm. Can you think of something new? And then they go through this process of like, mm, some are pretty quick with it. Some of them take a little while. So with me, Sledding Hill, you know, I might come up with, um, I think of how there's you know, plastic littering there now. Mm -hmm. So I might, you know, you know, I'll pick up garbage. I might come up with something like that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they take a little while and they think, I'll get back to you and say, no, 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 we're going to do this right now. And then, and people doing this for the first time, doing it with someone non judgmental and a friend or a spouse, or, you know, then work it through. It'll be a nice conversation. Mm -hmm. And then usually they'll come up with something that maybe it's something you've heard before, so you've heard people doing, but hopefully it's something they come up with. And then, mm -hmm. then it comes to step three, which is make it a smart, let's make it a smart goal. Mm -hmm. And you can look this up. SMART stands for specific, measurable, achievable, realistic time bound. It's not the only structure that makes things, but it's, it, this switches from leadership to management. This is right. to make it doable. It's, if they say, oh, I'll eat less meat, if they come up with that, it's much easier to say, I'm gonna eat 50% less meat for one week, mm -hmm. then I'm just gonna eat less meat in general. Mm -hmm. So help them by making it specific, usually specific and time bound is the thing to, is the stuff that matters. Mm -hmm. You know, it has to be achievable. If right. they say, you know, I'm gonna, I had one guest who said she wasn't gonna use any plastic whatsoever for a week. Ooh. And she came back and was not able to do it. So I should have been, I should have been more careful with the achievable part. Yeah. Actually, I mean, she was Beth Comstock, who was the CMO of GE, which I oh. think was the number two company uh, by market cap when she was there. Uh -huh. And she's now on the board of Nike and she's a best-selling author, all the stuff. And she came back, this is why I love great leaders she came back and said, I thought I could do it and I couldn't. She didn't try to hide. She didn't try to pretend. She didn't try to like, you know, weasel around it. Uh -huh. She owned up to it. And I think that was, a, for me, that was a great learning experience. I learned more from her, from her not, from her, you know, just being upfront about it. Mm -hmm. And anyway, I also learned, make it more achievable right. or help them make it more achievable. Sure. So then usually at the end of that stage, there's a, they have something specific that they want to do and, and they have, you know, and usually they start saying, oh yeah, I'm, I'm gonna do this. And then the last step is, remember there's a time element to it. So usually most people in my experience do something for a week, a month, two months maybe. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they'll go for a year. Uh, but I say, all right, how long do you think it'll take? I'd, I'd love to hear how things go. And if they say it's a, a week or two weeks or even a month, they'll say, 
how about we talk again in a month and I'll ask you how it went. Mm -hmm. Then, then you schedule that second appointment and a second conversation. Okay. And you can talk to them in between, but that's a time to have the second conversation. So we'll do the first one, you and me right now, we'll, right. we'll go through these four steps, five right. if you count step zero. Right. So and really, really quick, just to recap before we do that. So step zero, ask them if they care about the environment. Step one, yeah. uh, what do you think about when you think about the environment? And yep. be sure to name emotions. Uh, yep. Step two, based on those emotions, think of something to act on it. Step three, make it a smart goal. And yep. step four, be sure to schedule the follow-up. Sure yes, you sound like someone who's gone through this training before. <laughs> it, yeah, it, I might have. I might have heard it once or twice or five or six times. Yeah. <laughs> and the examples are all throughout the podcast. You know, it's always slightly different because of the guest. Uh, and then I guess, we, you know, it, I think we're going to have to do one more recording because we'll probably have to do the second thing. Sure. Um, and I'll, I'll go very quickly. The, when we talk the second time, I ask four questions. Can you remind me what you did? What, what did you commit to do? And what was the reason for it? Okay. And they'll tell you, the person will tell you what it was. Then right. you say, okay, what happened? And then it usually helps to give confirming, uh, not confirming, but just, you know, elaborate, ask them to share more. Mm -hmm. uh, then, okay, that was the what you did. What about the emotional journey? And prompt them to say, if they'll tell you how it felt while doing it. So prompt them to say, from the first, you conceived of the idea to committing to it, to planning and so forth to right now, mm. what were the, you know, what was the emotional journey? And then they'll tell you that and then say, okay, what about the relationships? Did this affect how you interacted with other people? Did it affect any relationships for you? Mm -hmm. So that's four questions, but it might, that, that can often be an hour of them, right. depending on how it went with people. Sure. So we won't cover that this time, mm -hmm. unless you come up with some five second <laughs> thing to do. Right. So uh, ready to yeah. start? Yeah. So this is, yeah, actually, so, so just for anybody listening or watching, Josh actually told me that he was going to be doing this with me today, but I totally forgot about it. And I didn't give it any thought at all between the last time we talked and today. So I'm actually a little bit nervous. It's like, uh Oh, wait, hold on. I haven't given this any thought. So we're actually going to be doing this for real right now because I haven't actually. And I'll give some more it. context. I've done this with you before in training you to start the podcast. Mm -hmm. You've done it with me twice, once recording for the podcast, but once before that recording for the podcast, you know that um, I've been training, what is it now, half, a half dozen other people to do it. Yeah. And that means each of them has done it with me twice. So you know that I've had it many, many times mm -hmm. and I've gotten to the point where I really enjoy doing more and more things. It, it, I've, I've lost the feeling like, oh, it's a burden. It's a mm -hmm. chore. To me, I know that I will discover something. So um, you have that exposure, mm -hmm. then you also have done it with several other people, as you mentioned before, with a couple of friends and your sister. Mm -hmm. So um, we're not going from scratch, but you don't have anything in mind right now of what you're going to come up with. No, though my mind is, is currently racing to be like, what can you do? What can you do? What can you do? Yeah, everyone who's, <laughs> see, everyone who's seeing you is like, ah, I can tell he's trying to. All right, but it's much easier after you share something that motivates you. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Is the environment something you care about? Is that something you act on? Absolutely. I do that. Okay. I, I try to do it regularly. When you think about the environment, when, mm -hmm. especially when you act on the environment, what do you think about? What motivates you? Is there anything that, that is in your heart? So my, my mind instantly jumps to a couple of different things. One is that just the other day, I watched the documentary, A Plastic Ocean. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I watched that documentary, uh, it obviously had all those images of the ocean and all the plastics in the ocean and all that kind of thing. And uh, watching that, it definitely brought me back to, um, I, I lived in San Francisco, so I didn't go in the ocean very much because it's really cold there. But we did take a couple of trips to Hawaii when I was a kid. And I do remember seeing how colorful all the corals and things were at that time. And I didn't go to Hawaii after that for probably maybe almost 20 years, maybe 18 years or so. And then I went recently with my wife and my daughter and all the corals were just not nearly as colorful as I remembered them being 
I remembered it being so much more colorful just yeah, I, and everything was so much more brown and and that that was definitely something that was a little bit of a shock to me and it and it it brought that feeling up again the other day when I was watching a plastic ocean um that's one thing that comes to mind well the, let's work with that okay sure and, unless there's something else that you were gonna that was already in mind um, the, uh, the other thing that immediately comes to mind, I'll just say it really, really quick, is that these days, most of, you know, I, for COVID, then I'm staying home most of the time. But the time that I do go get out into nature right now is to take my dog for a walk. And we have some hills right behind us where uh, every day I take my dog for a walk. And every now and then I decide to go away from the park and to actually walk up through the hills and just walking through those hills behind my house are just probably some of the most peaceful and serene time that I have every day right now. Just that time to just get away from everything and to just get out in nature and just 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 take a moment to just touch a tree mm -hmm. just is awesome. I love that time every day. So those those are the two things that most come to mind and we could probably go on either one what would let's go back to the looking at the coral when you're a kid what emotions did you feel if you can remember or for that matter when you're the serenity that you described when you go off the off the park out, out of the park oh man which one do i want to go for um I mean, for me, just because the park is, is, it's very now, it's very, it's something that I'm experiencing on a regular basis right now. It feels like the stronger emotion. Um, it's, I actually had this thought the other day when I was walking through the, the, the forest and I was picking up a couple of pieces of trash there, but I felt like a kid again when I was there. And that was something that it hit me while I was picking up trash that, you know, I had my dog with me and I took her off the leash because it's in the middle of the woods and there's never anybody out there. And so I just took her off the leash. And so she's running around the place and she's just being free. And I'm just like mm -hmm. wandering through and feeling like a little bit like an adventurous. I'm off the path. I'm, I'm taking a little adventure and I'm picking up trash and I, I was just like, it occurred to me that I'm like, I'm like some, like a boy and his dog. I'm out in the forest, you know, just wandering through the forest, being free and doing something, you know, enjoying the nature around me, just taking the time to look at the different kinds of trees around and to touch the trees or the grass. And then, you know, as I pick up trash too, I like get to feel the dirt and you get away from, nature feeling like you know like for a lot of people that live in like a city they might see dirt or touch dirt and like oh that's dirty that's dirty mm -hmm. Ugh, that's dirty i don't want to touch that but getting out there more i i appreciate it i i want to touch it i touch it and i say like oh yes that's that's nature right there i heard you say first thank you for sharing mm. i heard enjoy i heard free uh what what emotions can you name the emotions i mean though i mean definitely those are a couple but it is yeah it's a sense of pure very pure unadulterated happiness you know it's this feeling of connecting with nature in a way that is very pure and i, I don't want to say like juvenile or adolescent but like I said it, it's that that feeling of like it's like I'm a seven-year-old boy and his dog you know mm -hmm. adventuring in the woods maybe holding a stick and pretending like it's a sword and just just having fun and just enjoying and and enjoying the feeling of of not having pressure on you to do something or to feel like I need to go check my email right now or you know, not feeling like I have to go, oh, I've got to go edit that YouTube video. It's like, it's 
free and fun and just pure. Based on this free, fun, pure, childlike, if that's, you didn't say that, but that's what I heard. Yeah, that's a good word for it. Uh, I invite you at your option. You don't have to do it, but I invite you at your option to think of something to do to act on those feelings. And now, just to clarify, you know this, but Mm -hmm. I'm not saying to fix the world. You will have an effect on the environment. That's not the point. It's for you to act on those things. And uh, it's, there's three conditions that I find make it work mm-hmm. uh, through experience is it has to be something new, something, um, you know, you can take something you're doing and augment it and do more of it. That's mm-hmm. fine, but not something you're going to do anyway, or something you're already doing mm-hmm. something that you do yourself with your own hands mm-hmm. and something that um, has a physical component mm-hmm. so that we don't have to measure it. You can, if you want, you're an engineer, you might like to uh, measure it, but that's not necessary, but it could in principle have a measurable effect. And, you know, big, small, it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. It could be big, it could be small, but acting on those feelings. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So like I said, I already, I, I do some picking up of trash already pretty much whenever I'm out with my dog going for a walk, I do pick up trash already so what's something else i could add to that there is one thing that kind of jumps to mind um like i said i when i'm out in the forest i like i don't know what it is it's it's definitely a new feeling i never had this until recently but i do like to just touch the trees because i always Mm -hmm. i don't know i feel like maybe it gives me some kind of direct connection to nature or something like that but i never ever had that feeling before of wanting to just like just touch the trees but Mm -hmm. recently i've i've like always gotten out and i'm like i want to i want to get out and i want to touch them i want them to be very real to me and i want to know what does each different tree feel like and things and one thing there's always acorns and things dropped around in in the hills out there and I always see them and I always think like, I've never planted a tree. Mm -hmm. I've never planted a tree before. And it's like, I've thought about like, sometimes I think like, I, I, I want to plant a tree. I would love to plant a tree somewhere and have like my tree somewhere, you know, that Mm -hmm. I planted and maybe it'll be there for the next hundred years or 200 years. So that's one that comes to mind for sure. Planting a tree would be one. Um, That's something I've always wanted to do. Uh, There are, there are definitely in those hills, there are a couple of like pretty large pieces of trash that I always look at that I could, I could tackle those like, like tires, things that like are not just things I can just grab and take with me. So it's Mm -hmm. like, I just, I don't just leave them, but Maybe I could tackle taking on one or two of those, some of the big items. And then I would have to call and have somebody either put it in my car and deliver it to the waste dump place or call somebody to have it picked up and pay. Mm -hmm. Those are what immediately come to mind. Any preference between one, the other, or both? Uh, They they both fit the criteria. Uh Uh-huh. It's something that you're not already doing that you would do yourself and it has a measurable effect. Mm -hmm. Planting a tree is definitely something I've always wanted to do, especially since starting this uh, like verdant growth and starting the whole like trying to live more sustainably and things. It's like planting a tree, it's it's almost cliche Mm -hmm. as like the cliche thing to do for the environment, but it's something that I have never done and I feel like it would, it would, it would sequester carbon. It would make mm-hmm. more of those trees that I love, and then it would be something that, something that I did that would last maybe hundreds of years. Hopefully, if the tree survived that long. And would you take an acorn and bury it, or would you buy a sapling and? I think. And you can make answering that question part of it. Maybe you know. Maybe it takes a little bit of research. Yeah. Yeah. 
actually, that's actually a good point because what I was, what I just started thinking about right now is, is how would I do it if I was going to say, if I did go buy a sapling and I planted it in the forest or something, is that actually a proper thing to do? Am I introducing like an invasive species or something? <laughs> like, should I not be planting trees out there? Cause I don't have my own garden or I don't have my own property where I can plant a tree would planting it in the hills be a morally wrong thing to do? I, I don't actually know. Um, I could easily plant acorns. I, I have one sitting right here <laughs> on my desk that I uh -huh. brought home from the hills just as part of that connection. Um, I could definitely plant some acorns. I could even do both. All right. Like, let's, All right let's, well, let's make it a smart goal. Okay. So specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-bound. Um, what can you commit to specifically? Okay, planting acorns is easy because I'm I go out there all the time and I could just pick up a couple, a few of those, and put them in the ground without any problem at all. I will need to look up, like, is there an ideal depth to plant it in, or something, or or an ideal place to put them? Do they? Need yeah, I, I don't know an answer, but I would guess that they might not need to be planted because. That's not how ac no one's planting acorns where the, I mean, oak trees grow without people. So, yeah. So I guess you have to do the research and find out. Okay. All right. So that's one thing I will do. I will do the research and I will find out about the acorns, but on top of that, I will also go buy a sapling and put it in the ground. Okay. I think that that sounds like a good start. And not to influence you, but I guess after doing research to find out if you put this in the in the tree in the forest, is mm -hmm. it is it something that you feel comfortable about? Yeah, yeah, that too. I think I'm gonna have to do a little bit of looking in. I might have to actually look and see like what are what are the native species around, and maybe it would be better for me to plant another native species, something that's already native to the area. All right. So conditional on you finding out that that it makes that it would do something that you consider positive, an improvement. Mm -hmm. All right. So it sounds like those two things. About how long do you think it would take before, if I asked you how it went, that you could give an answer of, you know, a meaningful answer? Uh, I would say about, I could probably do it in a week, but let's just to give myself a little bit of time, let's, let's make it two weeks. I think I could probably get this done in two weeks. Okay, so after we do the recording, I don't think people need to see the scheduling part. We'll, we'll schedule a conversation for two weeks from now and the people that, they'll see the next conversation mm -hmm. and that will be recorded two weeks from now. Okay, sounds good. Now, here's a few questions that I'd like to throw in at the end. Yep. Is, I walked you through this process. Mm -hmm. Are you doing this for me? Uh, I'm doing it for you in the sense that I wouldn't I probably wouldn't have have made this commitment to do it, or I might not have made this commitment to do it if you hadn't asked me to find a challenge to do. But the reason that I chose this this particular challenge, the fact that it's this challenge came from me, came from me thinking about how I connect to the environment now. And so, no, I think that the the, the main reason I'm doing it is more because it's something that I want to do. And how do you think you'll feel about it? How do you think it'll be doing it? How do you think you'll feel afterward? I think, it, I think it's gonna feel good to do something that like I, I have, I've mentioned this obviously in some of my YouTube videos or things like as one of the things that you can do to reduce your carbon footprint, right? You can plant a tree, It's one of the small mm -hmm. things that you can do. And I've never done it, right? I've never planted a tree but I've suggested that other people do it. And so by doing it, it's going to feel good in that I will feel like I am now practicing what I preach. I will have improved, hopefully improved the forest that I walk in all the time by adding one more tree to the mix. And yeah, I, I think I, that's going to feel really good having done something for nature and adding one small, tiny carbon sink also. <laughs> now I'm going to go out of the mode of doing it and talk meta again uh -huh. uh, to listeners, to viewers, that notice a couple things. One, 
I did most of the talking most of the time, but I think that in this part of it, I did much less talking. Mm -hmm. It was much more listening, observing, paying attention, um, and I hope supporting. Mm -hmm. Then probably also people noted beforehand, you did not know what you were going to do. Mm. And yet it didn't take you very long to come up with something. It, it did, I, they might've noticed that you started saying, I'm already doing this, I'm already doing that. It's so hard for the people not, it's funny that when you get asked this, you start with like, here's what I do. So I just listen and let that happen. And the sharing of the emotion, the sharing of the images, you know, I, I asked them to give, you know, specific, you know, get really detailed. That really brings out what to act on mm -hmm. or how to act. Mm -hmm. Notice also the tone up until now, it was a lot of talking about, um, but notice how he got very personal and he got very like, I asked him, you know, what do you think about anything of the environment? People almost always are like this. They're recollecting, mm -hmm. they're going inside. Mm -hmm. That happens a lot. It's almost inevitable. Then when they start thinking about the task that they're going to do, it changes from, it's, it's not about like, but it doesn't matter. It's not big enough or it's the government's and corporations. It's not like, but what difference does it make? Cause he's at that point, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're thinking about yourself. You're thinking about your life. You're what you care about. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't fix the whole world, but you enjoy it, is that so bad? <laughs> and it, it changes the tenor, the tone. And I, I do this sometimes with like CEOs of mega corporations and they just, they start sharing of their childhood. And um, we have these great conversations. That happens a lot. That's the you know, the first couple of times you do it, you'll make a few mistakes. You know, someone will, you forget to say, um, it's not about fixing all the world's problems. And they come back and say, oh, but what I do doesn't matter. And you're like, ah, even I, I, I've not been able to get out of that hole. When, I've, yeah. when I get that response, I'm like, oh, I got to give up on this one. I forgot to say it. And I can't, once they say that, I've never been able to get them back onto something. Really? And if someone listening to this or watching this, hears that and then gets back on, Tell me how you did it because I want to learn from you. <laughs> uh, and it's a joyful experience. It's a, it's a reminiscent, a reminiscing, fun, usually experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, it can be, you can't tell, but it's usually 10, 15 minutes, sometimes half an hour. Mm -hmm. You can keep it going. I mean, now we're going back into the, the recording. Mm -hmm. But if I, st I could easily share about my stories with Coral or my stories with walking in the woods and sharing those. And that's really delightful to talk about the law, you know, kids today are growing up and they've never seen the colorful Coral or they see pictures and, but they don't, there's no way they can see it. Mm. It feels tragic. Yeah. And this is a way to do something about it. Right. Or we could talk about I would love to talk about how I planted a tree for the first time when someone did this exercise with me. I, I didn't know how to do it. And, but I was staying up with my mom and stepfather. And so we planted, and my stepfather was a big time gardener. So, and not just gardener, but he's planted trees and things. So he, we planted a tree together. So it was a family experience. Mm -hmm. There's many ways to go with this. Almost all joyful, fun, playful, open, sharing. And hopefully people watching are thinking, oh, I can't wait to, you know, they're probably watching this more than two weeks from now. So they get to just go to the next video. Right. We have to wait two weeks. <laughs> yeah. No, I think that it's something that everybody should give a shot to. I, and I will say that I think this is my second time going through this process, being on, on the, uh, the receiving end or taking on the challenge side of, of doing this with you. And I will say that it gets easier. This time was much easier than the first time. The first time Josh walked me through this process uh, in training for the podcast, it, it was really, really hard like to, to dig the emotions out and things. And Josh really had to had to <laughs> pry them out of me because I was because I know that the last time we did this, I was really like, oh, I'm not I'm not going I'm not going to feelings. I'm I'm sticking with the science. I'm an engineer. I'm sticking with the, the climate change and the and the rising sea levels and the wildfires. Um, and it took me a lot longer to to dig for emotion. 
But I think the second time through, I mean, obviously I kind of, I know where it's going and I've also done this with other people, but I think that you also realize that you have to learn how to be honest with, with yourself also. It's like, you have to learn to become comfortable with sharing how you feel with other people because that is how you're going to get connection and that's how you're going to get progress both mm -hmm. in you know growing yourself but you know and just doing better things for the environment every day also yeah it does get easier with practice on both sides i and when you said i had to pry stuff out of you i what i my way of doing that is not to pry but to support my and wording to, was probably not very good there. Well, it might've felt like that for you because you might feel like you're prying something open inside you. Uh -huh. But the technique when you're on the leading side of it, the, the person asking the questions, it's to recognize that there is something there. Mm -hmm. And the more they protect it, the more actually generally more meaningful and powerful it is. Mm -hmm. And the more that they will happy, they'll feel good sharing it. Mm -hmm. So, but if you say, come on, tell me what, that won't work. It's more like, okay, you know, were there, if they say something very broad and generally, you know, often the questions are, can you, or there's an image that comes to mind. It's something I say a lot is, you know, you're talking about nature in a broad way and you might be taken for granted that what you have in your head is what everyone has in their heads. Mm -hmm. But if you grow up in the mountains and someone else grew up in the ocean, it's in your mountains, maybe are they covered with trees? Are they, are they fir trees? Are they, uh, do they change color in the fall? Is it, are they big? Are they small? Uh, are you walking through them or riding your bike? And then that's something that often helps. And because oftentimes people feel like everyone's childhood was like mine, but they, that's not the case. Then, oh, and I want to add, this is what I call the building block. This is how to lead one person to have a rewarding experience and it generally shifts their feelings and expectations about the environment and their behavior, their actions on it to at the very least, I might as well do it. Why not? It, it makes my life better, but also they generally feel like I want to do more. Still one person at a time takes a long time. There's 7.8 billion of us. The, there's many, there's different structures that you can build with this building block. For me, I have the podcast. So my choice of guests is leaders in many different areas. Right now, if you are getting a coffee at Starbucks and they hand you a plastic cup, you probably have few to no role models of people who have figured out a way to get the coffee without the plastic cup. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you look around, you think, oh, should I take this cup? Oh, everyone else has taken a plastic cup. I guess it's okay, there's nothing else I can do. So you have lots of role models to keep doing what you've been doing. This is the opposite of leadership. To follow what everyone around you does is almost the opposite of leadership. So if I get very well-known people on the podcast, then I think people can say, even if they don't do necessarily something about the coffee cups, if you know people are acting, I think that's one way. If I can get people that are very well-known in many other people's communities, then they can say, ah, at least I have that role model. And that's a starting point. So my goals are Oprah, LeBron, Serena, people like that. Because I don't know anyone who doesn't know Oprah. And so if Oprah, I can't predict what she will do and I can't direct her. I can't say, why don't you go without coffee cups or use disposable and not you avoid disposable coffee cups. Right. I have to ask her what, what she thinks about when she thinks about the environment and let her come up with her thing. But there's this crazy thing that happens that the specific thing of her connects more with others than a broad generality. So I believe that I'm helping create role models among very well-known people in lots of people's communities. I think community motivates very well. Another thing is I've been, before you and I met, I've been putting out to the world, if you wanna start a podcast, I will help you. Mm. So I'm starting other hosts who I believe will also then find other hosts. Mm -hmm. And it feels like it's gonna grow in a kind of like um, CrossFit kind of way that there's no central big organizing thing, but there's a principles and a technique mm -hmm. and everyone who joins does it. You know, most people, the average person, if you ask them, would you like to, um, you know, really work up a sweat and get to 
work yourself out to full exhaustion. I think most people pick Game of Thrones over that. <laughs> and the people who go to CrossFit love it. Yeah. And I think everyone, even the people who pick Game of Thrones would prefer the fitness stuff. So CrossFit is like pretty intense. Some, um, but something like that, I think it'll grow like that. So that's another mm -hmm. building block that I've been working on is mm -hmm. one is getting well-known people to share what I expect, what in most cases is joyful, rewarding experience. Mm -hmm. Another is to get others, teach the technique to others and also how to start a podcast and so forth and how to reach people that are like beyond what they thought they could reach before. Mm -hmm. So that can spread that way. Another is just simply to go to people around you and just with the people in your life, even if you don't expect it to be, to grow past just maybe the 10 or 15 people you spend most time with. Mm -hmm. If you do it with those people, people expect, they come to me and they, they tell me about the things that they're doing because they know that I'm into it. They, they ask for advice on what to do. And you'll find that you, you will seek out people on trees. Mm -hmm. You will seek out people on parks. You will share it with people just because you like it. And your world will become more people around you. You will lead your world, both the physical world, but also like your, your social world to be more stewardship, more sustainable. And I predict also more joyful. Uh, my big thing for me is food. So there's much more, COVID's changed it a bit, but uh, people coming over, me going to farms, getting to know my farmers, getting to connecting a lot more with my family about how to cook these things and mm -hmm. childhood memories. Of, and that's what happens when you start with people's emotions. You start with what they care about. It doesn't have, that joy and all that could come even if it wasn't connected to the environment. It could be mm -hmm. memories of something else, but the environment is a gimme. Everyone loves you know, something of dogs or beaches or something. So, and also sadly, everyone sees it dwindling, not mm -hmm. dwindling, us crushing it. Right. So everyone has that motivation, including, you know, if I could get, hopefully I'll get one day the CEO of Exxon on my podcast mm -hmm. or in some conversation. And I guarantee that he, or maybe that time it'll be she, is, has their sledding hill or their touching trees or their corals. And it might not be lower, lowering fossil fuel use if they oh. believe that fossil fuels are like the key to the future, but there will be something. Maybe it'll be mercury in their fish or, I, you know, it'll, it's up to, it's their thing. Hmm. That's another building block is to reach people in politics, in business, people who are at leverage points of a system and can legislate or can change their company. So I work, that's another on, on not with a podcast, but privately, I work with corporate leaders, mm -hmm. usually C-suite people to do this process with them. And then now they can change the culture of their company, not just telling, not just telling their company, do this. You know, a lot of times when people say, oh, we can do well by doing good. It looks like they're being cheap and they don't get the value. They don't, it doesn't, they don't change the culture of the company. Whereas if they share something, if they, if, if the CEO shares an experience like this, then people hear it's genuine and authentic. Mm -hmm. It's coming from the heart. And if the person doesn't succeed, or if it doesn't, if the person doesn't solve all the problems, people, instead of accusing them of greenwashing, they help them. They see, oh, you're doing your best. It's not it's not finished. It's not getting us over the finish line. Here's mm -hmm. let's, here's how to do the next step. So if you're genuine and authentic, here's what I say. Here's part of my pitch when I, when I uh, meet with corporate executives and they're deciding whether to hire me is I say, a lot of people think if you act, you have to be perfect because they've mm -hmm. seen their peers get called greenwashing and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be perfect. You just have to show that you're doing your best, which is a much lower bar, but you have to show, you have to do it genuinely and authentically. If you fake that, then it'll be greenwashing. Mm -hmm. But if you show genuine and authentic, which means it's really much simple if, if this genuine stuff comes out. If, we, if I record this conversation with the CEO, so that, you know, like say it's an internal podcast, that's one way that we do this. Mm -hmm. Then the people in the company 
which could be the employees, but it could be the shareholders. It could be the, the board, it, but it could also be the customers or the suppliers. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the choice of, of the company, what strategy they want to do with this. Do they want to go big or they just want to keep it local or internal? But when they share that, then people see where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. And they say, not, is this person perfect? But they say, oh, I also have this coral thing. <laughs> but you know, for me, it was the apple tree. Right. So that's, those are a couple of the building blocks that I'm going from a one-on-one -on -one interaction to larger. And I predict that you know, within a year or two, this will catch on in a pretty big way, that there'll be a lot of people that are well-known people mm -hmm. that have switched over and felt like, oh, I prefer doing this to not doing this. I don't want to look away. Right. I expect that if I do it, it will influence people around me. And that influencing others is, that's the biggest effect that I can have. Mm -hmm. Especially if I influence them to joy, to find joy in it. Yeah. Well, we all hope that you that you succeed in your task, and yeah, we succeed it. in our task. You're That's part of the right. team. That's yeah. right now, and that I also can eventually get to the point where you are now, where you're leading people to actually make real changes to their lives. Well, you, that based on the words you just said, that you're you're already doing that. I certainly hope so, and that that feels good to to hear that <laughs> that there's even a possibility that that is happening. I've saw it happen. You sent me the videos, of, uh, the testing that you did with your friends. You sent me the videos and I saw it happening. That's right. Yeah, it's definitely happening. It's just happening on a much smaller scale for now than it is for you. So I'm Actually, working you, up I, to that. Can you share with me what you shared, if you don't mind sharing, I think it was not being recorded, of uh -huh. people contacting you later. Did Was that recorded or not? I don't think so. I don't think that that was actually recorded. Uh, I can't remember if it was recorded or not, but... In the case that it wasn't, yeah, I can explain. Yeah, really fast. Um, basically, in doing this exact exercise that we just did today, I did it with a couple of my friends, uh, one friend named Mark, one friend named Eric. And uh, in both cases, something that had surprised me afterwards, because you know, when you first do this, you ask them and you, you feel like it's gonna be kind of like an annoyance for them. Like, do you, do you have some time to like maybe just, can you give me like an hour to just practice this thing with me? Sorry, I don't wanna to take too much of your time, right? It, it felt like it was gonna be something like a burden to them, like something that they might just be like, all right, all right, all right, I'll give you an hour to do it. But we went through the process and we, they took on a challenge. And after the second challenge, I was really surprised that it didn't end there. It didn't end with just them taking on the challenge and them enjoying the challenge and discovering things about themselves. But they started coming back to me after that, like within a few days after having that second talk with Mark, he came back to me and said, like, you know, I've got all these electronics in my life. And I started to think now, are these going to have some kind of negative effect on the environment? How bad is it that I buy a new iPhone every year? Is that is that really bad? Like, is there some way that I can make that better? Because I'm, I'm a tech guy. And, and so I want to talk more about environment. I want to talk more about what can I do to make this better? And then not long after that, it was Christmas and Eric came to me and he said, um, I got into a debate the other day with my friend over whether, whether plastic Christmas trees or real Christmas trees are better for the environment. What, what do you think? I was hoping that I could get your advice on this because now I don't, I don't know which one's the better choice for the environment. I'm thinking about which one should I have in my house, right? And so in both cases, they both came back to me with almost like excitement that, that you know, they had made these connections now to the environment and were now actively thinking of like, oh, what can I do? What can I do to, to change this? And that made me feel really good. That made me feel like, wow, I actually caused them to, you know, think beyond just this one little challenge that they did. The building block is already forming lots. You've done multiple building blocks are coming together into a structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And let the record show like your smile in, in sharing this. It did. It, it felt yeah. good. It felt good to do. It felt good to realize I had an Im impact. 
and now I almost like, I almost feel like, ah, I kind of want to post those as episodes of the podcast just because they did have an, a, pos a positive effect. And I feel like, man, I kind of, whereas before I was, I would have felt a little bit embarrassed. Now I feel mm -hmm. like now that I saw the effect that it has, it's like, I kind of want to share that more. So. I hope people watching and listening to us are feeling like I want to have that effect on my community and that they go for it. If they want to go so far as to have that effect on a community that's an, as a community they aspire to be in, you know, someone at some point is going to come back and say, Josh, I want to do this sustainable life, Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And they're going to get the most amazing people, like the, you know, people that everyone knows by their first name, you know, like Brad, <laughs> Angelina and uh, Meryl. And someone's going to get like, someone's going to say, I want to do this sustainable life um, politics. Mm -hmm. And they're going to meet the senators and the legislators and, you know, whatever country they're in, or maybe they'll do this sustainable life hip hop. And they'll get, you know, I, you know, when I interviewed Brian Brayman, we recorded, it was actually in 50 cents studio in midtown Manhattan. Oh, really? But I'm not hip hop. I don't, I don't think I know any hip, 50 cent songs. <laughs> So I didn't do what anyone else would do, which was like to talk, he wasn't there, but I, to talk to the people there and like arrange to have, to see if I could get him on. Uh -huh. By contrast, when the World Science Festival had its event here at NYU, I'm talking up everyone because I got a science background. That's how I got Jonathan Haidt and a bunch of other guests. Uh -huh. um, so there's a lot of huge opportunity. Like if someone wanted to do the Sustainable Life Olympics, because they want to get, I've had, I just recorded with my second uh, gold medal, Olympic gold medal winner. Mm -hmm. Oh man, I love talking to athletes. Oh, yeah. I did sports, but not at that level. And so if people want, if they're thinking like, maybe they want to get a job in consulting. Mm -hmm. So if they want to do the sustainable life consulting, you know, I, I already got the three time global managing director of McKinsey. And I've, I've, I've presented on the stuff at BCG and I've talked to people at Bain. So it's like, it really opens doors. Mm -hmm. I would say, I would feel bad saying, you know, think of it as selfish, like what you can do for yourself, except that the effects of it, it's it, the reason it works is that we all share, you know, we all have our sledding hill mm -hmm. and we all breathe the same air. We all breathe the same, drink the same water and, you know, eat food from the same land. And if someone finds a community that for them, I mean, they could do, the sustainable life like Austin, Texas, mm -hmm. if they just want to do it local and geography based. Um, and if someone aspires to some group that they want to be a leader of, that people who are leaders currently will see you as a peer. Let's talk. Yeah, absolutely. Spread the message as far as we can. Get as many people as we can leading on environment. That's the dream, eh? Yeah. Well, the dream is, is, and, and enjoying it. Yeah. And the, uh, the dream is reverse, you know, the, I think we've hit the iceberg to some extent, but you know, mm -hmm. not go down and, you know, recover as best we can and, and re start rewilding and restoring. Um, and on a personal level, food is the easiest place for me to talk about. Like, I, you can put all the Ben and Jerry's in front of me that you want. I'm not going to eat it. I don't want it. It's the, <laughs> meanwhile, like this pear is going to be, oh, it's like, so the deliciousness, once my taste buds have recovered, is so much greater. Likewise, all the stuff about the, everything that you have in your life, throw nature in more nature. And I guarantee it improves it. There's, you know, I often, a lot of people say you have to balance mind and body, mm -hmm. mind, body, mind, body, spirit, mind, body, spirit, or God. Mm -hmm. I've rarely heard people say one more element that I believe is absolutely essential, nature. Mm -hmm. And our lives are more and more disconnected with nature. And I think if you try to, if you focus on just your mind or just your body, but not mind and body, something's missing. And I believe that once you, when you combine them, there's a, 
a synergy. Everything works better. And if you throw in spirit or God, okay, great. Throw in nature, poof, take out nature. And you don't know what you're losing, but it's tragic. Mm. And that's the experience of it. Walking in the woods, swimming in the ocean. There's also the stewardship component because it connects us to everyone in the world mm -hmm. in a way that you will connect more with someone in the Philippines by having them in your heart when you don't get bottled water ever again. Mm -hmm. than if you fly there to see them for a week, like you're going to the zoo. Mm -hmm. Now I've, it's an artificial uh, false dichotomy, right. but it's the, the direction that you go in that once you get on that path, you don't want to get off. You want to share it with others. And it will lead, I believe that it will lead to a world of stewardship, a world of, of abundance of nature and connection with people. I, ca I can't put, I can't put it into words. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we now are at a point where we're, we now have such a great framework, the one that we talked about just today. I mean, you've, you've made the framework, you've laid the grounds. Now we just need the people to follow it. So more people to get out there and not just manage, but to lead, to connect more with people where they are, connect with people rather than just tell people what to do. And so- You got it. <laughs> so if somebody out there, if you, if you want to, Act. If you want to try to take on a challenge, you can contact either me or Josh and we can walk you through the process. And for anyone who actually wants to try to lead as well, if you want to take the reins and you want to become a leader environment, you can also contact me or Josh. Yeah, you can do it on your own without, you know, this sustainable life being a part of it. Mm -hmm. I do hope that you'll make leadership in the environment. I'm sorry, uh, this sustainable life the brand part of it, because I think that will help more people it, reach more people more effectively mm -hmm. and create, you know, get that movement aspect of it. Mm -hmm. If you do it on your own, let us know how it goes. Yeah. Even if, you know, I'd love to hear and by only, I, I hope you'll publicize as much as you can. Uh -huh. You know, I hope you do it with, with the sustainable life. Yeah. Uh, but you know, let us know how it goes, what works, what didn't work. If you find something new, send us pictures of the trees that you plant or whatever. Yep. I agree. I think that whether you're part of this sustainable life or not, we're all fighting for the same goal, trying to mm -hmm. improve how we live and how we connect to the environment. Now that we're, it feels like we're about done with this episode uh -huh. after we record, I have, it's COVID. I haven't been outside yet today. It's uh, 8, 10 PM. So that means after we do this, I got to head outside and pick up some garbage. Cause that's one of my things that I pick up at least one piece of garbage every day. Mm -hmm. And then I go to the park and pick up more. Great. Oh, and I'm going to, one of my things is to turn off the, all my electronics and sing a song. So I will also sing. And now I do that at the beginning. I was doing it indoors, but I have to turn all. It's easier to do it outdoors because when I turn off my lights, I have to use the light of the hallway. Right. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go out, pick up garbage and sing. Nice. And the singing is, you know, I didn't, before doing this, it was like happy birthday and Star Spangled Banner. And that's all I sang for the first 40 odd years of my life, except sometimes getting really drunk to do karaoke. Once in my life doing karaoke, non-drunk. And there's a yeah. blog post on that because it was such a big deal for me. I was so freaked out. <laughs> now I, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Well, if you're ever out here in Japan, we can definitely get you into some more karaoke. Karaoke, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, Josh, for talking with us today. We had a great talk about how to lead in environment. We're going to have one last talk in the next series where we're going to show you how to how we wrap this up, how, how we talk to people after they've taken on their challenge. So I'm looking forward to that talk. Me too. So right. I'm sure I'll see you before then, but I'll see you also in two weeks. Yes. Thanks a lot, Josh. <laughs>